here's the thing. If nothing else, bears bears can't kill forty two boys. <laughs> yeah, unless they you're gonna have really a couple slow. get away. Yeah, you're gonna have a couple get away. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Dan McClellan. And I'm Dan Beecher. And you are listening to the Data Over Dogma podcast, where we increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and combat the spread of misinformation about the same. How are things, Dan? Oh man, life is good. We're, uh, we're, the end of the show, we're tackling one of the ones, uh, one of the things that I have been asked, we have been asked to tackle since the beginning, <laughs> uh, it is it, it's not much of a tackle. It is just a uh, one of the weirdest stories in the book. And, Two little verses. Yeah. And boy, does it just uh, throw you for a loop when you, <laughs> the, when you first encounter it. And then every subsequent time thereafter. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get to that. That'll be a fun chapter and verse. Uh, yeah. But first... It's a big dog. We're going. We're going heavy. We're hitting heavy. Okay. Uh, and diving into what is that? I have no idea. Uh, but we're talking about uh, the Holy Spirit, the Holy the Spirit, Spirit of God. Yes, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And uh, not to be confused with the holy hand grenade, right? Um, but uh, the Espiritu Santo is uh, there. I don't know how many places are named Espiritu Santo. Now that I think about it, I've been to like multiple places. Yeah, named that, including a place in Vanuatu in Melanesia. Oh wow! Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, the Holy Spirit. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about it. I'm I'm gonna tr- I'm gonna actually suggest that to understand what's going on with the way the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is working in the Bible, we need to understand a little bit about how people conceptualize of a human spirit, okay. because it's modeled after the human spirit, and this is actually something that I discuss. Uh, at some length in uh, my book, Adonai's Divine Images, which is an open access volume that is freely available online. But one of the... You're foolishly giving it away. Just <laughs> foolishly. <laughs> yes, I've, I've gone over many times about how the only, uh, the only compensation that I have from that, uh, from that book is actually the book that I'm holding in my hand right now. <laughs> they were, the, the contract said remuneration... 10 hard copies of your book. I gave nine of them away. This is all that <laughs> remains. So, um, so when, when I, I, uh, I spoke at a university in Kansas a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. and they were like, we'll get a bunch of your books here to sell and make you a little money. And I was like, not making me any money. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I don't okay, see any of that. <laughs> do it if you want to. It's, yeah. uh, it's got nothing to do with me. Yeah, so people are like, "Oh, they sold out of your book," and I was like, "You can get it for free online." <laughs> you should, you should that. pull a Taylor Swift and uh, and rewrite exactly the same <laughs> book, and then and then you'll own it. Well, I actually I had a bunch of uh, people request uh, audio versions, and oh. I, I went to the publisher and I was like, "I will record myself reading it for free, as long as I can distribute it for free." And um, I have not heard back from them yet. Okay, that, so. that's great. <laughs> anyway, anyway, there's this, there's, so the, once upon a time there was this spirit thing. Yeah. So um, to to understand this in a way that I think will be most helpful, I want to go all the way back to infancy because oh. one of the cool things about human infants is that we develop quite quickly a concept of the self. Mm. And it is based on some evolutionarily installed hardware. Uh, one of these things is the mirror neuron system, where we be, we see other people moving and doing things, and we just have this kind of intuitive sense that they're like us. And so we actually learn how to move from watching other people move. Right. And we map their movements onto our body, and then we map our movements onto their body. And we begin to perceive that we have thoughts and goals and intentions. So we're like, I want the ball or the cookie, and I can reach my hand out to grab it. And we see other people reaching out, and we're like, oh, they want the thing that they're grabbing for. And we begin to project the perception of goal-oriented action onto other people. And this this mirror neuron system is, is this 
just awesome thing that is in our brains that helps us to learn how to do things. And we also have this thing called the teleological outlook, which is based on this idea of goal-oriented action. As, as this becomes more sophisticated and complex, we begin to assume that everything that we see has a purpose and a goal. And so when things happen in the world around us that we don't understand, intuitively, we're like, oh, this happened for a reason. Something, someone, somebody with a mind or agency caused this to happen. And we also perceive a distinction between our, our intentions and our thoughts and the body because we can hide our intentions and our thoughts. They are inside of us. They're not visible on the outside. And that contributes to a perception that the self is not the same thing as the body mm. and that there is something inside of us that is distinguished from the body. And this is, uh, and then we also have uh, ideas about what are the limits of this thing? How is it contained? What happens when we die? And intuitively, yeah. we think that this thing just keeps going on. And so this is the reason that most, hum well, all human societies that we've ever been able to document, but most humans within them think of uh, the world as occupied by unseen forces and agents mm. of some kind. And in, in my book, I refer to these as unseen agents. Uh, and evolutionarily, you know, the the primate that was quickest to think the rustling in the bushes might have been something with teeth passed on right. their genes more regularly than the one that immediately assumed it was just the wind. Right. And so this um, installed in us a hyperactive agency detection. In other words, we are incredibly sensitive to the presence of agents in the world around us. And whether so they're you, there or not. Whether they're there or not. And so an interesting thing happens. Um, the brain has a bunch of different ways it can be cued to the presence of something. And our, our brain kind of projects a lot of our experience of other people. And if, it, if one of those cues gets tripped when there's nothing there, it, it can still seem like there's somebody there, just right. as real as if there actually is somebody there. This is why scary movies freak us out, and we think there's something in the shadows, or right. why we are quick to get up the stairs out of the dark basement and stuff like that. Um, and this contributes to the presence in all known societies of concepts of ghosts, spirits, Jin, um, you know, ancestors, some kind of unseen agents out there, right. and they're usually based on the concept of of uh, the human person. Yeah, they're they're an anthropomorphized uh, concept, which it makes sense if that comes from our perception of ourselves and others. When you yeah. know, you if you start the conversation with this with the mirror neurons, it makes sense that like the unperceived agents sort of in the ether that we're worried about would look, think, act like people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we don't confine them to bodies. Um, and there, there are, I think there are such fascinating ways that this manifests in, in the world today. Like people who go to cemeteries and talk to the headstones of their deceased loved ones, because intuitively it just kind of makes sense that we're focused on this thing, their names on it, that this is somehow, either housing their agency or it is channeling their agency or or something like that. Um, and there are a bunch of different ways that this bubbles to the surface within society. But it also means we think of people as having spirits, of having souls. Uh, and, and what exactly the difference between these two things is, is not very clear. Right. And the exact same thing is true of the Bible. They have... The ruach, which means spirit, and you have the nefesh, which means soul. Um, more or less, it's arguable that, that those are adequate translations of those words, but the spirit is usually understood as kind of an animating force, whereas the soul is is kind of the, the life force. Uh, and then there are a bunch of other ways that parts of your body are loci or locations of agency. Like, yeah, I, do, I don't know that I yet appreciate the difference between the two things you just described. <laughs> yeah, so, and and um, 
In in the Bible, the uh, the spirit will it, it's used synonymously with soul in a lot of places. Nefesh and ruach, you'll have the same phrase where you know there's there's um, parallelism and they're used interchangeably. Um, but the spirit is kind of like what keeps you alive, but the soul is your actual life. And so the the spirit, once you die, the spirit goes away, but your soul remains. And mm. so it's uh, and and this is the the concept of of life after death. There is some sense in which the the locus of that person's agency continues to exist, which is why we find evidence of uh, necromancy and ancestor cults and all this kind of stuff in the material remains of of ancient Israel and Judah. Um, and yeah, so I've seen this. You know, even people who leave their religion of of their birth. I've seen plenty of people hold on to some sort of sense of uh, of spirit or ghost or uh, they, like it is a pervasive and powerful idea. Oh yeah, absolutely, and it's it's because it's it's kind of baked into our cognition, and yeah. it's not something you can just turn off. And there's been a lot of research that shows even even people who flatly reject any kind of supernatural at all, intuitively, they still feel that, even if the reflective side of their cognition can kick in and override it. Yeah. Um, it's still just something that our our, our brains kind of do. Um, yeah, they want that. They, it, yeah. It just, it's, it's yeah, I'm, I'm in that category. I don't, yeah. I don't believe in any, anything supernatural, but I... Yeah, you spook me on a on a you know late <laughs> night when I'm alone and in the forest or whatever, and yeah, I'm gonna start seeing like shadows in the distance or whatever. Yeah, and like I remember when I was in college before I got kicked out of the University of Northern Colorado, I uh, I walked by somebody's room and they and there was a, a a woman in the room who had. A certain kind of perfume, and I had only smelled that perfume on one other person before in my entire life, and that was my high school girlfriend. And like immediately, she was there, mm. like her presence was there because that was one of the cues in my brain for her presence. And so, it's not even that it has to be supernatural, it's just how your brain kind of uh, um, helps you experience the world, yeah. But, um so when we when we get in the Bible, people have a ruach and a nefesh, just like God does. Right. Um, and so in the Hebrew Bible, we have the ruach Elohim, the which you see in Genesis one verse two, and it's usually uh, translated spirit of God. But both the word ruach and nefesh fundamentally refer to breath. Okay. And so it's kind of this sense that whatever this animating force is, whatever this life force is, it's it's kind of conceptually uh, represented as as breath. And uh, but it can also mean wind. So there are some people who will translate the divine wind. Um, mm. uh, there are some people who will translate uh, the the wind of God or the breath of God or something like that. Uh, and so. From the very beginning, this is representative of the the animating force of God. And just like with humans, where you can have spirit possession and you can have this concept that that the soul or the spirit can leave the body, mm. so too God's spirit can leave their presence, their body, wherever it may be. And so that becomes kind of the active agent for God on earth. Mm. And you see this reflected in a bunch of different ways. Uh, and in the Hebrew Bible, I think one of the most fascinating ways is, is in the idea of ecstatic prophecy. And one, I think, fascinating example is in 1 Samuel chapter 10, where Saul has been chosen to be king in Israel. And uh, in chapter 10, verse 6, you get Samuel explaining to Saul, then the, uh, from the King James Version, it says, "...and the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee." And thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. Yeah. And in the Hebrew, the the verb there that is usually translated "come upon thee," tzalach, actually means four century into or penetrate. Oh. And so the idea is that the spirit of God is going to penetrate you, and it says turn you into another man. Yeah. And in uh, a couple verses later, that's what happens, and it says God gave him another heart. 
And basically oh. the idea is that spirit, that that animating agent of God, uh, went into Saul's body, and the heart is kind of constitutive of personhood right. for them, and so altered Saul's heart, turning him into another man, and he had a new heart. Uh, yeah. But this is also what allowed Saul to prophesy, and this is this is Spe- ecstatic specifically prophecy. turned him into the heart of Patrick Swayze. And that <laughs> was when Whoopi Goldberg could speak on behalf of Patrick Swayze. Right. It was uh, it was a very intimate scene, um, and the mm-hmm. Righteous Brothers playing in the background and everything. Yeah. Um, but this is uh, this is spirit possession. This is someone else's spirit, and in this case, God's spirit, is forcing entry into the person, taking over executive function of their body, uh, and and probably in in the early conceptualization of ecstatic prophecy, threw him on the ground, tore his clothes off, and he was probably convulsing in an ecstatic frenzy, and that was how you prophesied. It's pretty exciting uh, stuff, man. Yeah, that's that's what the Spirit of God does uh, in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, <laughs> and um, but that uh, that concept of this uh, this agent, this extension of God's agency, changes as uh, the society changes. Once we get into the Persian and the Greco-Roman period, you're incorporating ideas from uh, Persian period about dualism. Uh, you start to get, in the Greco-Roman period, ideas about demons who are also these unseen agents. And so by the time we get to the New Testament, you have demon possession. So Yeah, I, presumably if a good guy can take over your body, a bad guy can probably do it too. Exactly. And, uh, and this is something that we see people worrying about this in what are called uh, magico medical texts so they're they're like medical textbooks and texts from the ancient world only it's more magic than it is yeah. medicine but it addresses things having to do with with the human body and pathologies and things like that so i i in a uh, a previous episode of the show i i joked about um demons getting in through the ear or during <laughs> menstruation and, and that's literally what some of these texts say, is that women are particularly susceptible when their, their openings are um, where the, the boundaries are, you know, their integrity has been, uh, has been compromised. And so... Yeah, yeah it, it's funny that a non, an incorporeal uh, entity would need a physical entrance, but right. there you yeah. go. <laughs> that's that's how it works. Just and, uh, open a door, then in they go. <laughs> <laughs> and so the uh, you know the ears were considered particularly susceptible to this, and <laughs> and you had magical spells that you had to do to to try to get that get that demon out of there. Kind of like I get my left ear, like if I go swimming or anything like that, or even if I just move my head wrong in the shower, like immediately it gets plugged up with water, and then I've got to be like wah, 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 <laughs> trying to get that out. I um, think you mean plugged up. With demons, Dan. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's yeah, but uh, a demon possessed person would never admit that. Right. Um, <laughs> and so the uh, you have the the further development of this concept of these unseen agents uh, that can possess your executive functions and can do good or bad things to you. And by the time of the New Testament, you've got these these demons uh, floating all over the place. But you've also got development in the concept of. God's Spirit and the Holy Spirit. So Ruach Elohim would be the Spirit of God, but you all also have Ruach Kodesh, which would be Holy Spirit. And mm. it's a, the same thing. It's God's Spirit, but because it's from God, it is holy. Uh, it becomes personified more and more. And this is something that you see with a lot of the uh, the features of deity, the aspects of deity when we get into the Greco-Roman period. So like Chochmah, wisdom in, in Proverbs 8 is personified, treated as this woman who was, you know, I was conceived back before the foundation of the of the earth and I was birthed and all this kind of stuff. So Chochmah becomes Sophia once we get into Greek and that becomes uh, personified and it resonates with the Greek concept of Sophia as this deity. And so you have kind of a goddess concept, uh, and you have other things that that are personified as well. But one of these things is is the spirit, which uh, comes into Greek as the pneuma, 
I'm trying to follow it all, man. I, this, <laughs> this concept is bouncing all over the place. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's such a complex thing to try to uh, to, uh, to reduce in a in a non erratic and chaotic way. And I'm well, sure and the- I think that's what spawned a lot of the confusion about about this entity, this you know, this Holy Spirit being. And yeah, I mean, may, we've talked about the invention of the Trinity as a useful tool because it does seem like the Holy Spirit is both its own thing and part of God. And yeah. it, that, that feels confusing. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it is confusing. It's because it, it's such an intuitive thing in terms of if, if we just let the, the natural um, intuitive cognition just kind of run wild. It's like, sure, we, we do that. It's, it's uh, just as natural as a lot of things. It's not until we're required to like sit down and explain it. And and usually it's how can you maintain these things in tension that you have to be like, well, it's, I would just check in the uh, overhead rotary girder on like, it just, <laughs> you have to, you're trying to rationalize something irrational. Yeah. And it usually requires ginning up all kinds of crazy stuff. Like the, the person who talks to a headstone in a cemetery, if you were such a jerk as to go up to them and be like, why on earth would you do that? You know yeah. they're not in there. That's like, just a piece like, of rock, man. Yeah. It's like, well, what? Yeah. First of all, that's a real dick move. But but second of all, the person's not going to be able to be like, well, you see intuitively what's going on. There, yeah. It's like, this, is, this feels right. This yeah. is just how I feel like interacting. Um, and there's a, a story, I don't know if I've shared it on the, uh, on the podcast before, but it's in my book where I talk about how, um, you know, the heart is still constitutive of the person even today. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a story about a guy whose 21 year old daughter was killed in a car accident, but she was an organ donor. And so her heart went to another guy named, uh, Lamont and he went to visit him and he brought a stethoscope and, um, listened to his heartbeat and was like, that's her heart within him, holding him up. He's like, I was so glad I got to meet him and I got to spend time with my daughter. Wow. And like, if you, you know, if you stuffed a microphone in that guy's face and be like, account for yourself, explain (laughs) how you can think that that's your daughter in there. Like, you know, they're not going to do that. Um, Again, dick move, but also it's just kind of an intuitive thing that you just let happen and you don't worry about it. Yeah, and that's it's how psychologically it for so useful long. to yeah. sometimes to to just have a a an object that you can sort of imbue with uh with with the meaning that is useful to you that is emotionally uh meaningful to you and you can just say hey you know I've I have literally talked to my dad's uh to my to my grandparents headstone and mm-hmm. to my dad uh who is who who I keep uh he he was uh cremated so i have him at my house and okay. i've talked to him before and yeah i yeah i mean i don't recognize the idea that there's a spirit of him in it i'm right for me it has the symbolic usefulness of like me communicating with with my past and trying to sort of reconcile my understanding of who he was with who i am and all this other stuff but yeah it's like emotionally and psychologically cathartic yeah and and that ex- that Intuition expresses itself in in all kinds of different ways, and yeah. you know it, the uh, and and another another thing somebody might be, um, you know, if someone were such a jerk to demand an explanation, I'm sure that guy after he left uh, wherever Lamont was and went back home, I'm sure he still visits his daughter's grave mm-hmm. and talks to her. It's like, but she was over there, yeah. and, but she's also over here. She's in that and, Lamont guy. What are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. And so the the concept of the spirit being both God and not God and being located in one spot, but also being, um, you know, accessible anywhere, it's just intuitively natural and it doesn't require explanation for it to, um, to bubble to the surface in social interactions. It doesn't until it does. And until then, it here's, does, right. Here's the problem with, uh, with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is that uh, it becomes a character. Yes. Uh, and uh, so, for instance, I recently, I was going to mention this, I recently, um, there was a, a, a tweet 
by Answers in Genesis, which is Ken Ham's <laughs> organization. Yeah. And it simply said, because the Holy Spirit has a mind, a will, and emotions, we know that he is a person. And I thought, wow, there's a lot packed into that one <laughs> very small sentence. And I, I tweeted back at them and was like, hey, would you please show us where in the Bible it says this about the Holy Spirit? I not know, like I genuinely don't know. Does the Bible say that the Holy Spirit has a mind, a will, <laughs> and emotions? Did they did they respond? No, nobody responded. No response. No no surprise there. Yeah. Um off the top of my head, I can't I can't think of any place that there is some personification of the Holy Spirit, but it is overwhelm it would overwhelmingly be in poetry and mm. in in metaphor and stuff like that. And and it's odd because a lot of a lot of conservative Christians would say you can't build a doctrine off of of you know like a psalm or right. or, or poetry or things like that. And and why it would be male um, strikes me. Yeah, as well, odd because the God's word's male, right? <laughs> the word the ruach. Yeah, that that's definitely the assumption. The word ruach is is feminine in Hebrew. Okay. Uh, although in the places where it talks about spirits as actual agents, sometimes as in First Kings twenty two with Micaiah, uh, it uses masculine verbs, hmm. so um, it can conceptualize of a masculine ruach spirit. Um, and then once you get into the Greek, I believe it's neuter, so it's in the middle. So it, it would actually be the third gender. If uh, if there you the, go. If the New Testament Greek uh, were considered inerrant, then right. um, it would have to be something in between. Interesting. Um, I I was in, I was mistaken by the way. One person oh. did uh, answer my tweet. Okay. And, and mentioned John fifteen twenty six, which says when the advocate. So that's just comes, the comforter. Yeah. Uh, I will send you. I will send to you from the Father the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. Mm. So is that the Spirit of God? Is that the same Spirit? Like, like, you know, this says, I will send to you from the Father the Spirit of truth. Is that the same thing that we're talking about? The I, Holy I think, Spirit? The Holy Ghost? I don't know. I, I think it treats these uh, these spirits, it uses different names for them, but I think it's it's basically just dancing around the idea that this is this active agent that that comes from God, and it's the the comforter or the advocate. Paraklitos is um, is the Greek word, which means a, a mediator or an intercessor or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's it's referring to God's spirit that way. But yeah, the the fact that this actually personifies the spirit is a is a little squishy. Because the the whole idea of of testifying, well, that's just something that you know the spirit could just be transmitting an understanding or a feeling to your heart. It's not right. like the the comforter is sitting there and whispering into your ear. It's testimony. Um, that that seems like a kind of squishy proof text for this notion that um, that the spirit has a mind and emotions and right. and a hairy chest and stuff like that. Right. That just well, and it's funny because the guy that tweeted that to me, I said that doesn't say anything about a mind, a will, or emotions, and he was like, "Oh, that's right. That's, that's, <laughs> that's true. You got me there." Um, <laughs> that was that was the only response you got, though. Huh? That was the only response I got, other than a joke from a friend of mine. So okay, well, yeah. And someone yeah, else say, and that. someone else pointing out that dogs have minds, wills, and emotions. So I guess they're persons too. <laughs> it's just, um, it, can you talk a little bit about? I don't know if you even know this, but it seems like the concept has evolved a lot over time. The concept mm -hmm. of, you know, it because it seems like most of the scriptures that I've read about the Holy Spirit are a very soft notion, like you said, like it's this. It could be its own entity, or it could just be God just sort of whispering something across the uh, the, the universe to you, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But at some point, theologically, it became a distinct entity. It became important enough that like 
Every Catholic priest, priest blesses someone in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Yeah, yeah. This this seems to be a, a New Testament development because it's it's treated as one of the things you have in in as you get from the Hebrew Bible into the New Testament is you have a lot of consolidation. Mm. A lot of things that are done by different figures in the Hebrew Bible or in the uh, the Greco-Roman period Jewish literature get consolidated into individual characters. So like Satan is every bad thing that happens in the Hebrew Bible is is Satan yeah. uh, in the New Testament. Everybody from Baal to um, in early Christianity, I would say after the New Testament, but you got Lucifer, you got the serpent, uh, you got um, Leviathan. Uh, everybody becomes Satan. And and just like Jesus is consolidating a lot of different traditions about mediatory figures. And so I think what you have is a lot of the different kind of uh, personified extensions of God get consolidated in the spirit. And because it is personified and you're getting to this Christological debate where we have these big questions about Jesus's relationship with God, there were probably people saying, it says the same thing about the spirit over here. And so it became um, rhetorically necessary to um, create space for that additional um, person of the, of the Trinity, and which then compelled it to be even further personified and concretized as an individual person. So I, I think that's contributing to the development, but certainly it is... Uh, it is among the different um, semi-autonomous agents that are discussed in Greco-Roman period Jewish literature. When you get into rabbinic stuff, you have you like the Shekhinah, which is the the presence. Uh, you have the Chokhmah, you have the wisdom, uh, you have the Kavod, the glory. Uh, even the name of God is a kind of semi-autonomous personified entity in, oh, in some literature and. Um, and so I, th I think the spirit is just the one that became the centerpiece uh, of this this concept. And I think there was also, when they had three, I think they kind of felt like that completed the set. Because uh, I, I don't think they wanted to get to, um, you know, a set of 11 different right. um, entities that, that comprise this trinity. And so, because when you look at Nicaea, and the Nicene Creed and, and the Christological arguments, the spirit is is not the center of the discussion. The spirit is kind of like, we got to have the spirit there. It's kind of a third wheel to the Trinity until subsequent centuries where it's like, it's here, we might as well deal with it. And they kind of flesh out a, a more full conceptualization of the spirit as this third person mm. of the Trinity. Um, but... It's it's certainly just. I mean, one it of, doesn't it doesn't fit into the other category. Like father and son makes a lot of sense. That that is a relationship that we know and understand. Person and spirit is a relationship that would be understandable, also. Mm -hmm. Though though to separate them as different entities feels a little weird to me. But like those two relationships are nothing to each other. Like you know, yeah. father and son and person and spirit feel like they are completely different relationships and completely different categories of relationship. And and when you see Jesus talking about the spirit, particularly in the gospel of John, it's like, I'm here, the spirit can't be here, and yeah, yeah. And when I'm gone, <laughs> then the spirit will be back. Okay. And so, it, yeah, it, it's certainly not like the relationship that Jesus has with God is is identical to the relationship that Jesus has with has with the Spirit. It's yeah. it's kind of like they're uh, they're you know competing brothers. Um, and yeah, <laughs> Spirit but, tries to show up, and he's already Jesus is already there. He's like, oh, <laughs> I wanted to go to that. You beat me. Um, and in in Greco Roman period Judaism, when you look in in Philo and things like that. You know, you have the logos, which is what Jesus, the word, which is what Jesus is identified with, but um, you have a handful of other figures as well. And they all get, they just kind of get brushed aside in favor of the spirit, or they kind of get mushed together with the spirit. Because like Hochmah, the wisdom, um, that is, there are early Christian texts where Jesus is, is identified as Sophia as the wisdom. And there are others where the spirit is identified as Sophia. So it's it's kind of still being worked out okay. uh, until you get to the councils 
and the and the philosophers who are like, we're going to nail this down once and for all. <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> well, let's vote on it. All right. Well, uh, I'm still confused about it, but that that gives me some some background, some some stuff to go on. Uh, maybe we'll come back to it. Who knows? Maybe yeah. people will have enough questions and we'll come back to it. But for now, <laughs> we're, probably we're, say, "Hey, that th- don't talk about that again." That was... Don't please don't do that ever again. Please don't <laughs> do that. But let's. But I'll tell you what they will be excited about: bears, bears. Duh, so bears. we're gonna the bears. We're gonna do a chapter and verse. So this chapter and verse. Uh, we are, we are going to second Kings. Oh, I clicked away from it. Oh, what a fool I am. Yeah. Second Second Kings Kings, chapter chapter two. two. Uh, and this, this is one of those ones that like, I I don't even know what to do with it. (laughs) I literally, I, it, it, it's a very self-contained story. Um, I'll just do the setup, uh, which Mm -hmm. is that, uh, the prophet Elijah, uh, starts off this chapter and he, uh, he and his sidekick Elisha, are, are you know tooling around the various parts of the of the ancient land, mm-hmm. uh, prophesying as they yeah. are wont to do. Yeah. Uh, Elijah gets in a truck and uh, and hitches his way back home to heaven. Yeah, uh, like, a, f- a fiery truck, <laughs> literally a uh, a chariot of fire mm-hmm. with horses of fire, which I think. And then in a whirlwind, which that may be the coolest earthly exit that has ever occurred, <laughs> uh, and, and, unless you get Thanos involved or something. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, a pretty a pretty uh, strong exit. Yeah, but it leaves uh, it leaves us with the the prophet now Elisha, who mm-hmm. is uh, who who is has some pretty big shoes to fill. Yeah, uh, when it comes to Elijah. Uh, including like just people not mixing up their names and thinking that they're the same person. (laughs) So now we're on to Elisha. And the funny thing is that this section of the Bible, uh, if you look, if you're looking as I am at the NRSV UE, uh, they like to, to sort of give chapter headings or sub like headings to subsections Right. And this one is called Elisha Performs Miracles. Yay. And that sounds really nice. Yeah. It's it's maybe not. Um no. I mean the first thing has to do with like a bowl and some salt and uh and then uh us you know get making water nice. Uh which is that's good. That's good. That's a helpful. spring a spring that isn't is has bad water and then he miraculously turns it into drinkable water. That's good. Um, but the next one is a little <laughs> something. Um, do, do you want to do you want to read it? Do you want me to read it? What do you? Yeah, how do you I, I, can, this? I can go ahead and read it. Okay. So we're in uh, Second Ch- Second Kings chapter two verses twenty three and twenty four. He went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, <laughs> saying, "Go away, bald head! Go away, bald head!" <laughs> When he turned around and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then, which I she- understand, I'm just going to pause you and say, <laughs> as a man who who has felt the sting of male pattern baldness, <laughs> I I am I I am understanding of him uh, cursing them. Yeah, I just didn't know what curse them in the name of the Lord, what the implications might mean. <laughs> then two she bears came out of the woods and mauled forty two of the boys. <laughs> And then from there he went on to Mount Carmel and uh, then returned to Samaria. That, <laughs> like it is so just just a tossed off little story. Yeah, forty two kids. Yeah, like that bear. Those bears were hungry. Not only that, they were efficient. Yes, you would think that they would if you got away. a crowd of forty two. Even two bears can't like corral <laughs> that many kids as they go and murder them one by one. But yeah, these these were these were uh, god bears, so they they apparently were capable. Yeah, I I I wonder what it must be like to feel the power of uh, fulfilling a curse uh, in in that way. <laughs> 
I, I imagine it has something to do with how Mike Tyson felt in the 90s when he would just <laughs> send men to the shadow realm. Um, I mean, I, it feels like I, it feels like maybe this was a don't know my own strength moment for <laughs> Elisha because you got to uh, feel bad. He doesn't seem too upset about it. No, but, no, that's um, true. Yeah. He just goes on vacation. And this is the, and this is something that a, a point I've tried to make on on social media in the past. A lot of times when we're reading these stories and we're trying to try to understand what on earth the, they mean, we try to cr- recreate these scenarios in our head and imagine them being historical. Imagine what the characters are thinking. Imagine what's going on in the background. Imagine what other people might be thinking. Yeah, which is in many cases, totally distorting things because most of these things are literary creations. They're not intended to operate on that level. Listen, inten- every literary creation I've ever made, I at least try to think about what the characters are thinking. <laughs> <clears throat> well, that's that's responsible uh, literary creation. <laughs> but sometimes what's going on on the page is the extent of of what the author is intending at least in terms of the details that are supposed to evoke whatever response yeah. from from the reader uh, but there are some things to point out here there's um there is an apologetic response that tries to understand these not as uh small boys as the NRSV translates uh the KJV says little children Mm. Uh, the NET says young boys. Um, <laughs> this and and the Hebrew here is literally na'arim ketanim, and that means small boys. And the the na'ar is is a can be everything from a newborn up to an adult. But when it talks about adults, it's usually talking about someone who is in a servile role. Mm. They're a servant, or uh, they have some role within either a household or a kingdom or something like that. Um, and so, like in uh, in in what is what does Princess Buttercup call Wesley in the beginning of Princess But? Right? She calls him boy, doesn't she? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, like it's because you know you're in a servile position. You're a boy, right. um, even if you're an adult. But usually, the the kind of um, generic sense is a child. Sure. Everything from a newborn up to, you know, uh, someone in their late teens. And, and making fun of a dude for being bald is a pretty childish thing to do. <laughs> yeah. And, and these are not just boys. These are little boys. Yeah. So it is, it is, these are young children. And the idea, they're, they're making fun of him. They're challenging his authority, basically. Yeah. Because they're saying, you're not the successor. Get on out of here. Uh, yeah. Or, or um, it, the way the NRSV translates it with "go away." Uh, if you, some people um, translate it um, "go up," and yeah, uh, I think K, the the KJV is "go up, thou yeah. bald head." Go up, thou bald head. And let me see. The verb there is Allah, which means "go up," mm. which um, could be saying, "Hey, follow after your predecessor." Why don't you go catch a chariot on out oh, of here? Why don't okay. you peace out? Right, just like him, and so it is. In a sense, it's challenging his prophetic authority. We like our prophets with hair, idiot. <laughs> and and so the the curse is is this this is like a a scary story to tell kids. Don't curse the prophet, or you know, rather than a witch cooking you in an oven to right. eat you, it will just be some bears will come out of the woods bears. and eat you. Yeah. So it is it's pretty gruesome. I mean, the Brothers Grimm got nothing on this. <laughs> this is like and 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 the specific number of 42. Uh it just it just gives it that je ne sais quoi, that little <laughs> bit of uh extra like reality because we named the number of them. It's yeah. not just random crowd. It's not just a bunch of them. It's, it's uh but it's, it's and it's yeah. Yeah. And it's not even normally you would use forty or seventy. Uh, that's that's kind of, you know, the the ancient equivalent of saying a million today. Right. Like it's it's a, a lot, a gazillion or something. It's a yeah. It, it's a fill in number for like a large amount, or right? Whatever. But here we have got forty two specifically. Yeah, six times seven, which yeah. um the yeah the there are debates about the significance of that. I don't think any of them. 
um, make any more sense than than the others. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we do have uh, we have this weird story uh, that is probably a something that was circulated around the time period that these texts were coming together as just a way to uh, to warn against challenging the authority of the prophet because. Uh, of what might happen, and yeah, back then, if if you were a, a young boy, there was there wasn't really mercy to spare for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> you if you mocked the prophet, uh, you were going to get what you deserved. Yeah, I guess so. Boy, between that and like Ham making fun of his dad for being naked, it, <laughs> it just feels like the Bible is very fine with disproportional punishments for seemingly. Uh, small minor infractions, yeah. yeah, yeah, and and I think there there are um, you know nursery tales and and stories where there are similar uh, what we might consider disproportionate reactions, but but yeah, those those are things that that definitely strike us as as far enough outside the the kind of ethical norm that they are troubling. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. You know, it's funny because this uh, this. You mentioned that there are uh, like apologetic discussions of this story, and you don't need them. Like this, this story doesn't prove anything negative. Like it's it, you you can't like. There's nothing in this story specifically that disproves the Bible, unless you twist it this way or that way, or that yeah. you know says something that like disproves the existence of God, unless you twist it this way or that like. It's just so gruesome, yeah, that it feels like there's no way this could have come from uh, a a a good and benevolent lord, and and I think that's why uh, apologists feel compelled to to try to reinterpret it is because it it is something that is just used to mock the <laughs> the moral. Uh, system of the God of the Bible. Yeah. It's like, hey, minors, little boys. He doesn't care. He'll kill them. Yeah. Um, in fact, something I when we were discussing this segment, I shared um, a a video. I it just randomly showed up on I think Twitter somewhere. It's a video of Sydney Sweeney. That's her name, right? I think so. Yeah, I, Sydney Sweeney reading this story from the Bible. Yeah, and it's like you know, it's it's like. Uh, sh- the video starts with her sitting in a big comfy chair and it's like, Sydney Sweetie reads the Bible. And then she's got this gigantic Bible and opens it up and just reads these two verses and then shuts it. And it's like, just plays it completely straight. Yep. Yeah. Uh, It, it definitely speaks volumes, these two verses for sure. But, but that's a source of embarrassment for, for a lot of folks who try to hold up the, uh, you know, the, God of the Bible as some kind of uh, moral, um, you know, lodestar. And it's like, yeah. no, they're pretty messed up morals in the in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament. It's yet another. I mean, if there's any takeaway for a believer, it's this is yet another reason to let go of the need for it to be a literal truth at all times, and gravitate much more toward uh, the understanding that this was a product of its culture and of its time. And not everything it says has to be the literal truth about an omnibenevolent, omnipresent God. Yeah. And and I'm sure there are many people over the last 2,000 years who have um, taken this as a personal challenge to find Jesus in here. <laughs> <laughs> to, because everybody's like every word of the of the Old Testament's about Christ. It's like mm, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you figure out how how a bald dude murdering kids with bears is it fits <laughs> into that rubric. And and yeah, the fact that it specifically says she bears, and I was looking at the Hebrew, and it is uh, where did it go? Yeah, uh, Stein Dubim, which is. Uh, the two feminine bears, which is a a weird thing to add. <laughs> yeah, um, another another like little detail that adds, you know adds some spice to the story. That and we, and this, yeah. I think this. Uh, I've seen a lot of I'm, not a lot, but I have seen uh, apologetic arguments before that have been like, "Well, how do you know those boys weren't messing with their cups?" 
because it says they're <laughs> they're they're she bears, so they were probably screwing with their cubs earlier, and so they were just um, they were just coming to exact revenge or something like that. Oh so. my god! Here's here's the thing. Um, <clears throat> if nothing else, bears bears can't kill forty two boys. <laughs> yeah, unless this, they you're, you're gonna have really a couple slow. get away. Yeah, you're gonna have a couple get away. Uh, it, <laughs> All right. Well, we'll leave it at that. Uh, for those of you who want more discussion from us, you can find it at patreon.com slash data over dogma, where Dan and I have a, uh, a after party every week uh, that is often related to the episode and sometimes not. And we can talk about whatever we want. It gets a little more personal. Um, so please feel free to head over there and become a patron. Um Otherwise, you can contact us by reaching out contact at dataoverdogmapod.com and we'll see you again next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.